This is Sarah Levitt with the Making Magnificence Project. And today my guest is Ben Fountain, award-winning writer with whom I had a fantastic conversation back in 2014 for the Making Magnificence Project. So Ben, welcome back. All right, thank you, Sarah. And I couldn't be like, I, I super couldn't be um, more excited. And I have to say, I know I'm not supposed to play favorites among the people I've interviewed, but our conversation back in 2014 um, will probably be imprinted on my heart and mind forever because it was such a gorgeous kind of sharing of your journey to go on the quest to write. Um, you were just so incredibly generous in that conversation. So, so thank you. And I'm looking forward to our five year plus retrospective. All right, very good, I'm ready. You're ready. So when we talked, Ben, in 2014, you had uh, two years prior published Billy Lynn's Half Halftime Walk. Is that right? Correct. Um, and I think it was already going to be made a movie. I think that kind of was in motion. Yeah, by, by 2014, it was well on the way, you know, to being made. It, it yeah. came out in 2016. Okay. So it was, so that ball was, was kind of in motion. Um, so, t so first catch us up to, I know you're working on a new novel, but catch us up to um, what you've been doing. I know you published another book, Beautiful Country Burn Again in 2018. Is that right? right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So kind of fill us in on what you've been, <laughs> clearly you've been writing, but what you, what you've been up to. Well, it, I was working on the novel I'm still working on and near the end of 2015, um, the Guardian newspaper, which is based in London, asked if I wanted to do some reporting for them on the upcoming 2016 presidential election. And, um, and I'd been thinking about what was going on in America quite a bit because I, I felt like we were heading into uncharted territory by the end of 2015. And I thought, well, 2016 is probably gonna be a wild ride. And so when they contacted me with this invitation to write for them, I jumped on it because mm -hmm. I felt like this would give me a chance to hopefully think through and observe in, in hopefully a systematic way what was going on in the country and and to try to make sense for myself mm -hmm. of, of what it, what was going on, or at least, you know, get a little bit farther down the road toward understanding. And um, I mean, I can't understand anything. I don't understand anything unless I, unless I try to write about it. So, mm -hmm. um, and so I undertook this project for the guardian and um, at the end of 2016, um, I felt like there was a lot more to explore in what had happened. And so the pieces I did for The Guardian served as the starting point for the book that became Beautiful Country Burn Again. So basically I took a three year break from this novel to write that nonfiction book, Beautiful Country Burn Again. And, and, uh, and then when all that was done and publication was done and book tour was done, I went back to the novel. Ben, is that, I already have like um, 16 questions that are that are percolating from our first couple minutes. So is that a hard um, thing to do to leave a work that's in, that you're really deep in to go do something that, because you're, because you're working on a novel fiction. Yes. Right. Um, so, and then to, to kind of jump to the observational kind of writing about political circumstances. Is that a hard jump to make and then to re to re-enter? Right. Well, it wasn't as hard as you might expect because I was having real trouble with that novel. And so there was there was there was a certain, amount, and a certain amount of relief at, at at thinking, okay, I don't have to wrestle with this for a while. I can go do this other new thing that right now it seems pristine and full of potential and unblemished. And I'm sure I'll get all tangled up in that as well sooner or later, but, but, um, 
but I'll set aside this mess I've created and go start on this other thing. And, um, and you know, it turned out, I think, to be a really good thing to walk away from that novel for a while um, and to do something pretty different. I mean, just mm -hmm. a, a different mm -hmm. way of, of approaching, looking at life and trying to make sense of life and in a very different area too. So, um, and you know, as far as difficulty, I find all writing to be extremely difficult and um, fiction, nonfiction, it's all hard for me. And, um, and I will say if I'm working on nonfiction, fiction seems easier. If I'm working on fiction, nonfiction seems easier. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you really can't win in that regard. Um, yeah, no, I hear you on like there, there was a bit of respite in kind of leaving, leaving the novel for a bit to go, go do something pristine. I, I heard that. Um, ben, you said something a couple minutes ago that caught my attention about how you can't really understand something or can't try to understand something unless you are attempting to kind of write about it. I mean, I'm paraphrasing from a couple minutes ago. Can you say more about that? So what is the writing process to you in terms of understanding? Well, you know, I think for me, and I think for a lot of people, writing is thinking. Mm -hmm. to, um, to sit down and think about your thoughts, to think about what you're feeling and what's going through your head. And, you know, we all have this kind of semi-articulate thought stream going through our head. It's kind of like this slurry or slush that at times it rises to the level of our and other times it's, it's more like this impressionistic, you know, kind of, kind of radio hum. And, um, but to dial into that and to try to put accurate words to, you know, the experience of what you're going through, to me, that is, um, I mean, it really forces you to concentrate and reflect and, you know, number one on the substance of the experience and number two, trying to find a language that, that depicts as accurately as possible that experience. So, um, and, you know, and what going into that is, you know, are, are, are things like organization and, and um, you know, sequential thinking, critical thinking, analysis, um, and also, you know, I mean, the emotional component and not discounting that. So, um, so that's what I mean when I say I, I really don't understand anything unless I try to put words to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, writers are just, um, you're like magicians to me. So, you know, like I, I read a sentence and I think, how did someone construct that with that meaning? Like, how did they even, how did they even get there? And I'm thinking to our first interview in 2014, when you were talking about your journey to write, leaving the law at 30, correct me if I'm, if I'm botching any of this, um, leaving the law at 30 to kind of go on this quest to write and it taking 10 years before you could, I think, again, paraphrasing, kind of get down to what you were, stop skimming the surface, I think is what you told me then, to kind of really get down to what you were trying, trying to say. Has that process changed at all? Like, are you, are you more able to get to what you're saying faster now? Or is it always just I, a wrestle? I, it's always a struggle, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. always, always. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, I feel like um, I'm a stronger writer. I work a little bit faster. I'm faster to engage with you know the center of something you know the, the the difficult center of of an experience um i just feel like you know i've learned some things and um and uh i just feel like i'm a better writer so yes i mean it's still a struggle always um it still takes maximum con concentration but but i do feel like i'm stronger 
I would, I would, yeah. And I want to talk to you about kind of the quest and how it takes shape, but can you tell us, I don't want to jinx you, but can you tell us at all about the novel that you're um, working on? Um, yeah, I don't have any problem talking about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, uh, it, it is set in Haiti in the early 1990s. Um, and it deals with the context of it is an actual historical event. There was a coup d'etat in Haiti in 1991, and um, and it led to um, a military regime, very authoritarian, an international embargo, a great deal of of hardship and and violence, and and destruction in, in Haiti, a country that couldn't afford any of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I started going to Haiti in 1991, and uh, and so I I've written about Haiti, you know, over the years in, in various ways, and um, and so I undertook this novel after Billy Lynn, having stalked it for a while in my mind, and and uh, I mean it, Haiti's a complicated place, and I felt like well maybe now. After, after going there for, at the time, over 20 years and having, you know, immersed myself in, in the literature and the study and the experience of the country, maybe I could, I could write something worthwhile about Haiti. So, so that's, um, you know, I finished the full draft. I'm in revisions right now and hopefully it will come out next year. Wow, so you're anticipating next year. Okay, you'll have to, you'll have to keep me posted. Um, what, 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 I'm curious, what was it about Haiti that drew you initially and then kept your interest in going back? Yeah, I, um, I'd been writing for a year or two and I'd started keeping files on things that, that you know, just interested me, you know, just to put, to put it crudely. And the file on Haiti kept getting thicker and thicker. And I had always been intrigued by the country. It's, it seems so different from, you know, anything else. And, um, and there was also the intellectual question or, or the historical question of why, why are things so bad? Here? Mm -hmm. and why, why does it seem so intractable? And, um, and then there was just this in, intuitive sense of, I need to go there. There's something there I need to try to understand, and mm -hmm. and maybe there's a different reality or a different side of the reality that I'm living that I really need to engage with if I'm going to be the kind of writer that I think I want to be. And I'd never been out of the country, and uh, I was 33 years old and um, just had a little bit of French, and and one day I just showed up in Haiti. I didn't know a soul. Um, I, the only thing I knew to do was get in the cab and say, take me to the Hotel Olufsen, which is a grand old uh, hotel there where, where uh, things seem to happen. And, and so that was the start of it. Wow. And then it was, tw did I hear Ben, 20 years that you continued to kind yeah. of go back? Wow. Yeah. yeah. And was yeah. it a regular trip every year or... I was trying to go twice a year. Wow. wow. And, and sometimes it was more than that. Um, there were a couple of years when I didn't make it. Yeah. Um, but generally twice a year up until 2016. And, um, and then I spent those, you know, three years writing this book on politics. And, and by the time I was done with that, the, the situation in Haiti had degraded to the point where where it's, it's really not, it would be a bad idea for me to go right now. And, uh, and that's what all my friends there tell me. And um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so unfortunately it's been five years since I've been there. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about your first novel, uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk and um, all this research that you were doing on Haiti is kind of, to your point, like the file was accruing, but it's a very different, I mean, Ben, you tell me, it seems like a very different exploration than Billy Lynn's 
kind of what that novel is about. They seem like two very different worlds is where, is where I'm going. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely accurate. I mean, you know, Billy Lynn takes place mostly over the course of one day at, at Texas Stadium where yeah. the Cowboys play or yeah. used to play. Yeah. And, um, and this novel I'm working on now takes place in Haiti, yeah. which is very far away yeah. in, in pretty much every way you can think of. And yet they're all linked by structures and systems of power and economics. And, um, and uh, I mean, it's all one global system. Mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. where it's all one global convergence or network and in a way the people in the haiti novel are they are very much caught up trying to negotiate their way through the same system that billy lynn is in um in billy lynn's long halftime walk so so in a way the problems are similar but the context is is different. Yeah, gotcha. Yes, I was just because I was thinking about context being seemingly uh, very different, and how you've got kind of Haiti kind of running in the background, so to speak, but not really because it's twice a year while you're working on Billy Lynn. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I will say this. Um, you know, one of the set pieces in Billy Lynn is the halftime show. Yes. And. Um, you know, Billy and his comrades are in the middle of, they're down on the field in the middle of this, this completely over the top extravaganza, media extravaganza. And, and approaching that particular aspect of the book, I was trying to figure out what exactly is going on with this halftime show. Is it, is it just dumb? I mean, is it just this big spectacle that, mm -hmm. that really has no meaning, no power. It's just like, you know, noise and lights and, and or, or is there something else going on? And I didn't know going into the writing of that scene. I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. And I have to say, I don't think I would have made any headway in writing that scene if I had not been to a lot of voodoo ceremonies in Haiti. Interesting. And Interesting. Yeah. in a way I ended up looking at that halftime show through the lens of a voodoo ceremony and performance and the way these kinds of rituals tap into very basic things about human nature. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so, so voodoo helped me write Billy Lynn. Yeah, so in fact, it's not running in the background. I mean, there, there's um, convergence there. Yeah, very much. I mean, I, yeah. I'm, a de I'm a desperate writer. And so I'm reaching and grabbing for anything that <laughs> might help me understand. <laughs> I'm not buying the desperate writer thing, Ben Fountain. Um, so the last time in 2014, when we did our our first interview for the Making Magnificence Project, much of the focus was on your journey. You know, I really want to understand because your journey to write, Ben, was really um, arduous. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. yes. um, it was, you know, it was a quest. I think of it as a quest, you know, that, that you went on this kind of quest to, to write. And we talked about critical junctures, um, finally getting to a place of, I think, being Zen about the work, again, I'm paraphrasing, and showing up for the kind of the virtue and pleasure of the work that's, those are your words, you know, in and, in and of itself. Um, one of the things I'm curious about is post kind of Billy Lynn, I mean, there had been, to your point, there had been some, some success before that, um, but it had been a long, a long journey. Yes. Does the quest take, so yeah, I'm sorry, I'm taking a long time getting to my question. Does the quest take a different shape after acclaim? Because you've had significant critical acclaim at this point, Ben Fountain. I mean, I could rattle off, you know, push carts, oh, Henry, you know, all yes. kinds of stuff. Ben Hemingway. Um, does the quest look different inside of you once the acclaim comes? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I think it does in a way, 
Um, I mean, maybe, I mean, it's nice to have some success and it's nice to get some recognition. It's nice for your family. It's, um, it's nice for, for, it was nice for me in the sense of, well, maybe I'm not completely deluded <laughs> about, about doing this. Maybe I am doing something that's, that's mm. worthwhile mm. and maybe I can, can, can continue to do that. And so it makes you a bit more psychologically secure. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, the work was as hard as ever. I mean, if there was an, an award that a writer could win, that would make the work easier, but we would kill one another for that award. Yeah. But, you know, you can win yeah. all the awards, but it's still hard as ever to get the words on the page in, in the correct way. And so this work keeps you humble. And so mm -hmm. within, you know, mm -hmm. keeping in mind what I just said about, you know, a little bit of psychological reassurance and security, there's still the ongoing uncertainty of, of doing the work. And, and, you know, I realized, I mean, when I was looking at your questions beforehand, I was thinking, well, what have I been doing since 2014? And, and I, I've been doing a lot, I think. And um, I mean, I've been doing, you, you know, I've got a TV project going and this novel and, um, and some nonfiction things I continue to do. And, and I think that, that what, what links all these things is, I don't know if I can do any of them. And like when, mm -hmm. I, when I undertook this Haiti novel, I wasn't, it was like, I don't know if I can do this. It, it, it feels like a lot. And when, you know, the invitation came to write about American politics, I thought, well, I, I don't know if I can do this. Um, I've never done it on this level before and, and with hopefully this depth before. And then with the TV project, it was like, well, I'd never written a script before. I, I don't know if I can do it. And, um, and I think, I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a very genuine way, I was welcoming that aspect of it. Um, of not knowing that you could do it, am I? Yeah, yeah, weirdly, because that's, that's the only way you keep learning and you stay interested is, um, and you know, there's failure. I mean, you're gonna fail. Um, more or less, you know, to a, to greater or lesser frequency and or to greater or lesser degree. Um, but I think that's the thing that keeps us engaged and interested in life. And it's the only, the only way we can really do something worthwhile is to, is to, you know, keep trying these things that we aren't sure we can do. It's interesting you mentioned uncertainty, and I and I want to hear about this TV project. It's interesting, interesting you mentioned the uncertainty of it because one of the things that so stays with me from our conversation in 2014 was um, how you navigated within yourself, kind of the psychological aspect of. It. So you're saying you're now slightly more psychologically secure, um, but how you navigated that perpetual state of uncertainty. Uh, you know, that really stays with me. And so it's interesting, Ben, now it sounds like the quest in some way is making sure that that uncertainty is present in a way. Would that be overstating it? No, I think, um, I think, you know, that's a very real part of it. And, mm -hmm. and perhaps it comes from a certainty or a near certainty that, that, you have to be uncertain to get anywhere. And um, you have to be working from a standpoint of, on the one hand, a certain level of confidence, a certain level of peace, you know, with the prospect that you might fail, but also, you know, from the standpoint of uncertainty, I don't know if I can do this. I'm really mm -hmm. going to have to stretch myself um, and learn some new stuff if, if I'm going to do anything decent. 
with this particular piece of work. Tell us about the TV project. I've not, I've not heard about this yet. Well, yeah, and I mean, there's, it, it's, it's still pretty, um, you know, it's within a small group right now. And, you know, the way of these things, it kind of, you know, it heats up and then it cools off and then it heats up and it cools off. And, and because there's a lot I can't control about it. And, um, but um, some good people in the film and TV industry, um, they came to me and said they, they would be interesting, interested in, in anything I came up with in the nature of long form TV. Wow. And I'd had some dealings with these people before and I knew they're, they're good people and they're smart people. And, and so I said, well, I don't know anything about TV and I've never written a script. And they said, well, just think about it. And wow, wow. And so about a couple of weeks later, I thought of something and started making notes and, and those notes, you know, expanded and, and um, which led to a pilot script, which led to many revisions of the pilot and, um, and, you know, various documents that spin out the premise and, and um, the development of the show. And, um, and it seems like it's, we're going into a period of heating up where maybe we'll get to the next stage. Um, I'll say this, Sarah, I, I have always assumed that it would never get made. Mm. And so I have always written it exactly the way I wanted to in yeah. the way that pleased me and actually really not giving a damn if anybody else likes it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, because that's the only, those are the only terms I want to work on it. Yeah. So, uh, so we'll see, but you know, I've learned a lot and, and it's kind of fun writing scripts. Um, and uh, so we'll see what happens. You have to keep me posted. I am super excited, um, okay. but you, you've made it to the big screen. I mean, Billy Lynn's long halftime walk was made into a movie. So this is old, this is old hat for you, Ben Fountain. Um, do you write, um, so regardless, do you write as if it, something is not going to get published? Yeah, I write to please myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, this is something I've thought about. I mean, it, if you're, I mean, sometimes people say, well, well, who is your audience? Who are you writing for? Right. Or yeah. is there one person in particular, living or dead, who you're writing for? And, um, and I have to say the answer to all those questions is no. Um, I'm rarely thinking about a specific person. Um, I'm not thinking about an audience. I don't know who that would be. Um, but I've wondered, well, does that mean it's self-indulgent? What I'm doing, is it narcissistic? Is it, is, is, and I don't think so. I think, I mean, when you do this kind of work, my experience for a while, my experience has been, it's almost as if there's this critical sensibility or the shadow self standing at your shoulder. And it's you, but it's something besides you, like all the things you've read, thought about, um, whatever critical sensibility you've been ever able to develop you know, all your experience is in this shadow self and you're trying to please the standards mm. of that shadow self. And, mm -hmm. and the only way you do that is by writing the story as authentically as possible. And really, I mean, to hell with everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, you, you, no matter what you're writing, you are writing to, to that standard. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. it comes and goes, but, um, but yeah, I would say, and you know, the only other writer who, Tim O'Brien and I, um, you know, the great American writer who wrote The Things They Carried and Going After Cacciato, um, he and I were in a conversation for a documentary that was being made about him, and that question came up, who do you write for, and he and I realized that, that we had the same experience that he's not really writing to a specific audience, but yeah, you know, this, this shadow self, this, yeah. this 
critical self hovering at your shoulder. And, and that was kind of uncanny that, that, you know, he, he has had, he has worked from the same experience. Cause it is often that, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not a writer, but it's often the case that writers are kind of instructed to think about one person to what you were saying a few minutes ago, the one person they are writing for or an audience for whom they are writing. Yeah. Right. And you know, I've got no problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, mm -hmm. we all have to find our own way. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's talk about the blank page, Ben, because you've mentioned it a, a couple of times. And I was thinking about, um, you know, in the context of the business leaders that I work with, you know, I'm thinking of serial entrepreneurs who, no matter their success, when they kind of step up to the next business, you know, I've had very successful people say, it's, it's scary. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's still scary. Um, and I'm wondering, so I'm hearing you say earlier that that blank page particularly when you were wrestling with the novel, the blank page of writing a kind of politically oriented book um, for The Guardian was, um, was kind of tantalizing because it got you out of the, but um, talk, talk about the blank page and how you kind of show up there. Because I would imagine that that cuts across um, all industry and life experience when we show up to something that's yes. New. Yeah. Yes, I, I expect so. And, um, and even when you feel like you've had, you know, some success in, in, in dealing, you know, with, uh, with those challenges, it's still always staring you in the face. I mean, no matter what you're doing, I mean, can I do this? Am I going to blow it? Is, is um, and, you know, you want your endeavors to succeed. So, I have to say, as the years have gone by, I've become more comfortable with that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And in a way, welcome it. Um, again, you know, coming at it with, with, from the standpoint of, this is the most interesting thing, actually. You know, not knowing if you can do it. And having to learn, you know, a lot of things in order to be able to do it, things you don't even know that you're going to need to know, but that's what keeps us engaged mm -hmm. in life. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that's what's called living life. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I mean, it's never easy, but the difficulty of it seems to become more manageable or, or even welcome. Say more about it being welcome. Well, let me, let me actually from a different angle, because I'm hearing you talk about in, the engagement with the unknown as being um, kind of the juice there. Do I have mm -hmm. that? Yeah. yeah. Um, did you welcome it when you were, let's say, 35 or 40 and at more toward the beginning of the, the quest? No, I was terrified in the beginning. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, because yeah, I mean, everything I was writing was so bad and I knew it was bad. And, and I didn't know if I would ever get to the point where it might be. Yeah. Oh. And so um, those were hard years and those yeah. were very uncertain years. Um, now, I mean, with experience, um, feeling like I, I have a somewhat better grasp of, of this kind of work that I've undertaken, um, much more comfortable with mm -hmm. the uncertainty of it and the challenge of it. And, um, you know, now talk to me on Monday morning, you know, I may be singing a different tune. And there's, there's also this aspect of within the overall uncertainty and the overall challenge, you, you learn to break it down into fairly discrete chunks. And so that, and you know, it takes a lot of energy, psychological, cognitive, to get these things going. And also to move on to a new stage of the thing you know, where you're really entering uncharted territory, say you've done one part of it and there's satisfaction in that and a certain level of confidence. And, um, 
but then you gear up, you gear yourself up. You know, okay, this is the next stage of it. As uncertain as the first stage was. Mm -hmm. but, and so within these cycles, uh, I mean, there's, there's cycles of tremendous expenditure of energy and concentration. And as you get that part of it un under control, you know, you can relax a little bit, or it's not quite as hard. And so while you're working on that, you're, in a way, you're recharging your batteries. And I mean, the mind is an amazing thing. Your mind is also, I've found, you know, looking ahead on, on a, you know, on a subconscious level to this next thing. And I've found that when I get to that, often, you know, certain things have already revealed themselves to me about how to get into it. So, you know, cycles of, of yeah. tremendous concentration and, and understanding like this is a really challenging part of it. And then dealing with that and in the course of dealing with that and, and getting some mastery of it, you know, you're able to recharge and get ready for the next big part of it. I'm hearing Ben, what might be a, a distinction um among between you and many people who are approaching the blank page, whether they're writers or otherwise, you know, I, I've often read about, and you'd have to help me here. I've often read about writers, artists who show up to the blank page or the blank canvas after success. And it's, you know, the, the, what's going on in here is, can I replicate it? Can I do it again? And I'm not hearing that with you. I'm hearing, I'm welcoming the, uncertainty because it keeps me kind of engaged with yeah yeah is that uh, yeah you know I think um I mean do you have any of that oh my god like am I going to be able to do it it's like it's not even part of your dialogue yeah I'm not thinking about replicating yeah anything yes it's, it's not even a part you know Sarah I, I was a failure for so long and I had to learn to live with failure in terms of, of the regard of the world and my yes. profession. Yes. And um, I had to become pretty self-sufficient psychologically in terms of, you know, what am, I, what am I doing this for? And where is the satisfaction and the pleasure and the sense of, of worthiness coming mm. from? Hmm. my own worthiness and the worthiness of the work, if any. And so, you know, to the extent I had any success, it came, you know, a long time into my quote career. I think it might be harder, a lot harder for people who have success early in their career. Yeah. yeah. Um, because these other things get in their head. I mean, having success is nice. When people throw parties for you and give you <laughs> awards and checks, and I mean, it's it's really nice. Not and, a bad deal. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you can get like a little bit addicted to that rush. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I think you know there is, and I've felt it in myself at times. I mean, where you know, not not in a strong way, but I felt it where you know, somebody gives you an award and you get home on Sunday night and you wake up mon Monday morning and you're thinking, gee, I wish somebody would have a party for me, you know, again today. <laughs> that was awfully fun. But then Can I, I have another party? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that was awfully nice of them. Can I have another one, please? And I think it's a human thing. Yeah. But yeah. then I think, well, then I get to write. You know, I'm lucky. I mean, and after a day or two, I'm fine. You know, that little itch, you know, goes away. And then, and then you're like, no, I'm lucky. I, I, get to, I get to do this. This is what I really want to do. So, Which is so interesting, Ben, because that's one of the most um, touching things that you said that really imprinted with me from our first interview was that after your first two novels were kind of shelved, that the next day you woke up and said well, at least I still get to write. And so that kind of touchstone within you, despite the external remains the same. So whether it's the novel got shelved, which is a deeply bruising disappointment, 
or there's a party that was just thrown for you, it's still coming back home, it sounds like, to the work. Yeah, it really is. And yeah. um, I mean, that's been something I've learned, you know, over the years. It's, it's uh, I didn't know what to expect. I don't even think I was thinking about what to expect. Yeah. Um, but it's just something I realized about how my own head works. Something you said earlier in our conversation was that you, you have kind of made peace with failure. And to your point a minute ago, you had significant, you had significant hurdles <laughs> that you crossed on your way to acclaim. What does it mean to you to have made peace with failure so that you can show up at the blank page and say, look, I'm going to do what I do and we'll see how it goes. I think, you know, looking, I mean, getting settled in yourself about why you're doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, are you doing it for fame and fortune? Mm -hmm. Um, Or are you doing it out of, out of a different kind of need or compulsion or, you know, just a different engine is inside you. And, um, and I was forced, you know, to, to decide or realize or count on this much more personal engine. Mm-hmm. Keep going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And otherwise I wouldn't have kept going. Um, I would have, yeah. after 10 yeah. years, I would have gone off to business school and, you know, join corporate America or, or, you know, whatever, but, um, no, so that's my answer. Yeah. And what is the engine for you? You know, ultimately, I mean, trying to make sense of life, trying to make sense of human experience, trying to understand it. And you could say that the things I write are the record of me trying to understand. Mm. Mm. And um, in a very overt way, beautiful country burn again. I mean, this is very much a record of me trying to figure out what in the hell is going on in this country, in our collective life. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, in the fiction, maybe with a new, a few additional layers of, of disguise and concealment, but it's still the same thing. And, and that's the drive. And, um, and, to get it on paper, to get it on paper in, in the most authentic way possible, which that's art. That's the art of it. And where it becomes not just information, but it becomes an experience for the reader. And, um, and you know, a life experience just like, you know, other life experiences to yeah. a greater or lesser extent. So that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, right. As I said, writers are just kind of like magicians to me. I think, how did that sentence get crafted and mean that in in just a few words? Yeah, it can be a thing of beauty. True. It yeah, is a, oh, it is a yeah. thing of, of truth and beauty. Yes, and they're bound up together. And, yes. Um, yes. And it is an extraordinary thing to do and to see done. Hmm. Um, in the, in the time that we have, I've got a couple last questions here. Um, you've given me some of this, but I want to, um, kind of circle back. What are you kind of most curious about as you look to the future? Huh? That's a great question. Um, I will say this life gets more interesting as I get older, um, I mean, you build up a certain backlog of experience. And Mm. I mean, I can remember when President Kennedy was shot and I can remember, uh, you know, stagflation of the 1970s. And I remember Nixon and I remember Reagan. And and so you see that that maybe there are certain things that, that recede and come forward, recede and come forward. But I do feel like we're, 
there is something new under the sun now, and it's the role, the over potentially overpowering role of technology, mm, and, mm -hmm. and just sheer speed, speed of change, um, and the and the profoundly disorienting effect of that, and just um, and you know the 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 order that was that came about after World War II, that is definitely fraying, and. Um, and so I think there's a great deal of uncertainty out there. At least that's my perception. And, and so I am, I'm deeply curious to the point of, of deeply worried about what's coming. And, um, and so that's what I'm, I'm, I'll be focusing on and am focusing on now in my own way. Yeah, in terms of what's coming, Ben, kind of the things you've you've touched on, so kind of technology and the speed of change, and I heard you say to the point that it's disorienting, um, and and order. So, it, it, as those things kind of converge or separately, are you kind of thinking about them? Well, I mean, I try to think big and I try to think small. I try to keep as best I can these big things in my head, you know, thinking about them, but mm -hmm. also with regard to how do we as individuals try to carve out some degree of agency and self-determination in, you know, within these large systems that in a way seem to be getting increasingly, you know, overwhelming and overpowering. Um, you know, it, it's hard, it gets harder and harder to make a living mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. you know, a critical mass of this country mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, harder and harder. I mean, opportunities are, you know, for a critical mass of the country, they are hard to come by. And, um, and so I, I try to think, you know, on the large scale, but also always very much at the level of, you know, the micro level, the level of a, of a family and an individual trying to live a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I could talk to you forever, but I, I won't. Uh, so you've got, you've got writing to do. My last question, which I've begun to ask all uh, interviewees is what does magnificence mean to you in your own life? It means devoting a great deal of energy and concentration and heart and soul to trying to do this kind of work in a way that will, that might result in something worthwhile, something that will shed, you know, some, some helpful light on human experience. And, um, and, you know, part of that is trying to live with equal amounts of concentration and focus and energy and heart and soul toward the people around you. Mm. And um, I mean, to me, it's all bound up together. And um, that's what magnificence is to me. And, you know, there are large magnificent lives you know, the lives that get into history books and, and, and the people about whom biographies are written. And then, you know, magnificence can be as common as dirt in the way of, in our own small way, we not famous people, never destined to be famous people. Um, we can live magnificent lives in our own way. Absolutely. And, and you're, you're, you're kind of famous, Ben Fountain. <laughs> well, well, it's a byproduct. <laughs> Absolutely, of, of the magnificence. Um, thank you, Ben. This is, as always, just a joy um, and a, an honor and a pleasure. So thank you. My guest today for the Making Magnificence Project has been 
Ben Fountain, acclaimed and award-winning writer. Thank you, Ben. Sarah, thank you. It's always a pleasure.